All right, welcome to a Monday edition of On The Tape. Guy Adami, welcome. How are you, bud? Great weekend. Excited for this. EY from SoFi joining us every Monday. This is going to be, what do the kids say, banging or something like that? I think it's good. Is that what you say, Liz? Is it going to be banging? Uh, that's not the word I would use. I'll say it, it, it'll be electric every Monday. Okay, so that electric voice is Liz Young from SoFi. Guy likes to call her EY from SoFi. She's the head strategist over at, at SoFi. What do we say about SoFi, Guy? How do you get your money right? When I go to SoFi, the reason I do that is I like to get my money right all in one application, or I right. guess the, as they say, all in one app. Right. So so Liz uh, joins us on Market Call on Thursdays, and we go over her weekly market outlook that you can find on SoFi.com slash blog. And also, she had a drop guy in the podcast. What's your favorite podcast store? Well, it's funny you say that. You know, I sort of vacillate between stores. It really depends upon how crowded they are, right. you know, the parking lot, those types of things. Dave. Right. Right, right. Got it. So she has a podcast called The Important Part. I think that dropped today. She took some Q&A on her 2023 outlook. So check that out in your favorite podcast store. Okay, guys, let's get into it. What we want to do on Mondays here a little bit is we are going to have a conversation about what we are most focused on for the market week. And we might take a quick look back on some things that happened. And then also in the B block, the second block, this one is going to be, as Guy just said, banging. We have Danny Moses, he is our Friday co-host of On the Tape, and he's got Vinny Daniel, and he's got Porter Collins from Sea Wolf Capital. You guys have heard them on the podcast on many occasions. The three of them have a great conversation. They're talking about, Guy, is it finally gold's time? They do have a few thoughts on Tesla at these levels, so you're going to want to hear what they have to say. They've been bearish and right for a very long time, the fiscal health of the U.S. consumer, and a whole heck of a lot of other things. So stick around for that. So Danny, Porter, and Vinny. All right, before we get into what we are most focused on for this week, let's go back to Friday's reaction to the December jobs data. Um, again, right out of the gate, we saw the futures rally off of a number that was a little hotter. Guy, I don't know if you saw this, though. Liz was on like a, I don't know, a 12 box, a 16 box on, on the Squawk and Friends there, <laughs> ready to give instant analysis. Did you see her on that? I absolutely did, and she can verify this. I actually texted her because I was curious – they had one gentleman, I believe his name was Tyler. He was either broadcasting from the Hotel California or some monastery in Taos, New Mexico. By the way, I always just like saying Taos, New Mexico. They should put a Rayos in Taos. Back to you, Dan. All right, fair enough. All right, Liz, so, so I remember you had the last comment right before the number came out. You thought uh, it was going to be a little hot, but you didn't think it was going to be a big outlier one way or another. Yeah. But the stock market rallied almost immediately and closed near the highs of the day. And bond yields, the 10-year, got hit pretty hard. So what was your take yeah. on the result? Because, I, I, again, we're going to talk about the potential for soft landings and pivots and all that sort of stuff. Because that narrative like permeated uh, the, the fin twit over the weekend a yeah. little bit. Going into that report, if nothing else had happened before, I thought that the December data was the first time that we might see a crack in the labor market. And when the number came out, the other thing is some of the stuff that led up to it, you know, we had initial claims, continuing claims, continuing claims had have to actually come down. And when you looked at the jolts data, that came in pretty strong as well. So it started to make me realize that, you know what, maybe this isn't the first time we're going to see a terrible number. And that's why the comment that I had right before it came out was, you know what, I don't think it's going to be all that surprising in either direction. And what it did was it kept the hopes for a soft landing alive. And that doesn't mean that it guaranteed it, but it was a pretty perfect report for that month in the sense that we're still adding jobs, everything seemed reasonably strong, and wage growth came down a bit, which is what the market wanted to see. I think that was if, if nothing else, I think that was maybe the biggest thing that drove the huge rally. OK, maybe wage growth isn't the problem that we thought it would be. The Fed won't have to be as hawkish. And that's why you saw the reaction both in stocks and bonds. Agree with everything EY said. It was probably in terms of the report could not have been much better. But I'll say this. You then subsequently have had a number of different Fed officials come out. And I'm, what I I'm, think is trying to happen is they're interpreting this data, but they're saying, you know what, we're still staying on our current path. I mean, the hawkish rhetoric around the Federal Reserve is still out there despite this. And I'll say yes, and a one-off number, it was very good. And you're not seeing the wage growth that everybody feared. Obviously, services economy, two-thirds of this economy, that's really the important thing. 
but one report does not a trend make. So I think it's a great way to start, but I, I would think even EY would submit we're nowhere near out of the woods yet. And we'd have to have those types of reports over and over and over again in order to actually orchestrate a soft landing, which I don't think is going to happen. This is a point I, I made on the show. I can do it a little bit longer here, but so the conference board has their usual confidence survey. As part of that, they ask questions to consumers. Do you think jobs are plentiful? Do you think jobs are hard to get? If you look at history, the time when that jobs are plentiful data peaks usually leads a peak in the labor market by about eight to 12 months. That peaked in March of 2022, which would mean if you do the math, we are probably at a peak in the labor market sometime between the December and March data of this year. So we could, that could be the peak. We could have just heard about the peak, and then we start moving down uh, for the rest of, you know, let's say the next three to four months. Yeah. So if we're thinking about the, through the lens of the markets, uh, both the, the stock and the bond market, I mean, again, we saw peak inflation data over the course of the summer, and markets got a lot worse, right? We crescendoed lower into October. We rallied. And I think what's really important, I, I mean, when I think about the new year, we had a volatile first week of the year, and I think, you know, hotly anticipated that data at the end of the week. And, you know, sentiment was really bad going into the year end, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't going to take a whole heck of a lot to get the markets to bounce a little bit. I guess more importantly, I'd focus on that move in yields because, Guy, we saw that 10-year got down to, what, three, four, five or something in early November from a four and a quarter peak, um, you know, just a few weeks earlier before that. And, and here we are now. We're, we're headed back towards that. And, you know, our good friend Carter Braxtonworth is calling for a much lower 10-year yield, at least as he's thinking about the technicals. And I just want to kind of go to Rosie, what David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research had to say this morning in his fine piece here. He said, weakening pricing power and software demand are a bad combination for corporate earnings and reinforce our belief that the current estimates are still way too high. And so, again, we could be seeing some peak data as far as good jobs number that are going to get worse. This is the thing that the Fed has been waiting for. And I guess the soft landing is predicated on the fact that maybe they just don't get horrible. They don't get mm -hmm. like as bad. You know, we don't kind of mm -hmm. go into some, some sort of negative territory. So I guess my question to you guys now is like, we're going to be very quickly focused on corporate earnings, right? Mm -hmm. Q4 earnings are kind of in the bag. It doesn't really matter. It's like Q1 guidance and for current year 2023 are going to be really important. So how are you thinking about expectations into earnings? And I'm going to go back to these three huge rallies that we saw off of respective lows in 2022. We had that kind of March, April rally. We had that June into August. And then we had that October to early December. All of them came around earnings seasons, if you will, after the Fed had just done something. And part of it was sentiment was really really bad. And I think a lot of investors in the stock market were expecting really bad guidance. They didn't get it and stocks rallied. Here we are now where we're kind of in the midpoint of that range. I think the high in December, early December in the S&P was kind of like 4,100. The low was just what, 3,500 or something like that in October. And here we are 3,900-ish. It's like expectations aren't that low right now. There's a few things I would say. So if you go back and, and think about those quarters and what we heard from companies in earnings season, we had lowered the bar quite a bit. They were leaping over a, a ridiculously low bar, but still somehow managing to eke out positive earnings growth in aggregate each quarter. Fourth quarter earnings is expected to be negative by about, let's say, 2.8, 2.9%, depending on who you're looking at. That's the first quarter of negative earnings growth that we will have since 2020, if that's how it comes in. The other thing I would say is, and I said this in my 2023 outlook, we can't have it both ways. You want inflation to come down. If you want inflation to come down, demand has to come down. Yep. If demand comes down, pricing power comes down. If pricing power comes down, revenue comes down. If revenue comes down and costs stay equal or don't go down as much, earnings come down. That's just mathematically, there is no other way that it works. So we have to probably hear about some type of earnings contraction. Does it have to be hugely dramatic? No, I don't think it has to be a 20% contraction in earnings year over year. I think it could be somewhere 5 to 10% in a contraction in earnings. And the reason that we can manage to keep it that benign of a contraction is because we're coming into this with record high profit margins, right? So there's a bigger buffer. But like I said, you we, you can't have it both ways. You can't expect inflation to come down and not have some collateral damage to other things, and earnings is one of those. Could not agree more. And I think what the market appears to be taking its cues from is the fact that this data suggests 
that maybe the Fed's job is done and all systems are go, clear skies ahead. But I don't think that the market is uh, taking into consideration is the fact that your point, earnings need to come down. And we had a great conversation with Mike Wilson on our podcast on the tape that dropped on Friday. And he talked about pretty much exactly that. And as you parse through some of the analysts, some of the numbers that people have out there for S&P earnings, they continue to get ratcheted down. And I think you would submit and Mike would submit it also. You don't necessarily see a trough earnings along with the trough multiple, but both those things seem to be coming down. What's the right multiple in this environment and what's the right number? I think consensus right now appears to be around 210 to $215 worth of earnings. I think Mike's bear case has it about 180 or so. I think you're going to see more and more people come to that conclusion that earnings estimates are still too high in this environment, regardless of what the Federal Reserve does, Dan. And the multiple that you pay for those earnings, almost by definition, this environment needs to come down as well. Yeah. So I think Mike's base case is about $195. I think his bear case was 180. I think consensus is still like 220, guys. This goes back to our friend John Butters over there at FactSet. He had a report out in his earnings insight blog a few weeks ago, just kind of going back and looking at the last 25 years on average. I think strategists 12 months out have pretty inflated estimates for S&P earnings. I think about six and a half percent on average. And you know, if you just look at Mike's base case scenario, we probably have to come down 10%. And that's something that could happen all at once as we kind of get some guidance. You know, I think it was interesting. We talked a little bit about this last week, guy. You know, Microsoft, you know, Satya Nadella, mm -hmm. I, I think is easily probably one of the best CEOs on the planet right now. Okay. And, and when you think about what he has done since he took over for Steve Ballmer at that company, and, you know, it was a $2 trillion market cap company, you know, at some point last year. And some of the commentary that he had in an interview, I think it was on CNBC India early last week really got, I think, a lot of investors spooked a little bit of some of the commentary that he had about just kind of the U.S. demand environment and what was likely to happen in 2023. Remember, we had those two consecutive days where the stock was down nearly 8%. Again, mm -hmm. this was nearly a $2 trillion market cap company. You know, when you think about that, I mean, we could have, if we had an Apple, a Microsoft, an NVIDIA, like a handful of these major companies downgrade their outlook for 2023. I mean, that could be the thing that causes all the major S&P be, you know, strategist to kind of lower those estimates. And then at that point, you might start discounting, right, what's to come, which is what you just said, Liz, that we had on a quarter to quarter basis last year. I mean, mm -hmm. the estimates were coming down over the course of the quarter, just by a little bit, a few percent here and there. And when the companies came out and they guided, they were able to kind of come in line. And that was enough for the stock market. But the strategist didn't lower their, their full year enough or the 2023. And if you just do the numbers, so a 5% contraction, which is really Really no big deal. Yep. A five percent year over year contraction would bring us down to like two twelve per share. A ten percent contraction, which I'd argue still isn't that big of a deal, you're down to two hundred two oh one per share in earnings for twenty twenty three. I think we should be okay with that. I think we should be happy with that. And always remember the sequence of events. The market broke in twenty twenty two, right? And it probably still has a little more downside, but it broke in the sense that we got to bear territory, things fell apart, we had this valuation compression then earnings break, then the economy breaks. So the idea, just to really bring this back to the beginning of the conversation too, the idea that we had one good jobs report at this point in the cycle yeah. is really not that exciting, right? That The jobs report probably doesn't get bad until a quarter from now. Yeah, guys, By the way, really Dan, I mean, oh. unemployment rate is still three and a half percent. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that was a, the pre-pandemic low, which was a 40-year low. But guy, I just want to make one quick point. So let's just say... Liz is correct and doesn't think that down 10% in S&P earnings is a big deal. So let's just say $200 in S&P earnings is a consensus. Mm -hmm. And guy, wouldn't you say it would make sense to throw a 16 multiple on that, which would be below the five-year, 10-year average. But like that's how you kind of get to a trough because 16 times 200, you can do that math, yeah, is 3,200. And the pre-pandemic high was 3400 3390 or something like that and again that would constitute an overshoot of that high and that would make some sense from a sentiment standpoint that yeah. would make a lot of sense and that's what we've been i think we've been saying pretty vehemently for many months now you know i think ey has echoed that as well a lot of people seemingly coming away to that way of thinking for me to say it that's one thing i i would discount it if i were listening as well but when somebody like David Tepper says pretty much exactly the same thing, 
a couple weeks ago, then I think you have to take notice. And by no means am I suggesting that he was listening to us. I was listening to him for a few years ago and just interpreting what he would think in this environment and proved to be correct. So again, we're not bearish for the sake of being bearish. We're just trying to look at the math here and to try to come to some conclusions. I will say just anecdotally on a day like today, you see Lululemon who had a ridiculous inventory build their last quarter. We spoke about it. I think it was an 84% year over year inventory build. We said that day, there is no way whatsoever that their margin is going to hold up. Lo and behold, look what happens to Lululemon today. I know that's a one-off, again, anecdotal, but it's somewhat indicative of what's going on throughout corporate America, Dan. One of the things I don't like about this week is that we're going to kick off earnings season with the banks. And, and I'm I'm bullish on financials this year. I like financials, so spoiler alert on that. <laughs> but we're doing, it's all going to happen on Friday the 13th. I don't love that. I don't love that we have to do it on a superstitious day. Guy, and it's going to be this guy, ominous guy, get, thing. Wait a second. Hey, hey, stop yeah. it for one second because I've been trying to be serious this entire time. But you're telling me, I will say this, Dan. Everybody loves Stevie Wonder's version of superstition, which was fantastic. What I will tell you is, Go and listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan version of Superstition. It's tremendous. And me not being superstitious, I think Friday the 13th is, to use the word I used 18 minutes ago, banging. All right. So here, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about the banks because on Friday morning, this is pre-opening, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, all report. There's throw BlackRock in there just to have a little fun here. And when you think about outperformance of the bank stocks since – October lows nearly doubled the performance of the S&P 500. I think the S&P was up, mm -hmm. you know, 18% or so and, and many of those stocks were up 30 plus percent and you know even JP Morgan. I mean this is one where its ability to consolidate the way it has in and around here for the last couple of months it's really outperformed the S&P just as it came in in December is pretty remarkable. But guy on Fast Money the other day we had Mike Mayo, who is a very well-followed and a guy that we like a lot, bank analyst from Wells Fargo, he was pounding the table on Bank America. Do you remember that? He said that this is a company that should do far better than many of its peers in a high rate environment. But it was really interesting when rates came in, the 10 year came in from four and a quarter, as we just said, to three, four, five, I think from those early November highs to the mid December lows. Bank America got absolutely creamed. It acted so much worse than many of its peers. So are all of these money center banks, are, are they built the same way? Because that was kind of really interesting to me. And then the outperformance of the Goldman and the Morgan Stanley's, the investment banks relative to the money centers for 2022 was pretty stark. So I'd love to get your granular take on some of the banks, guys, we had into Friday. And then I'd love, Liz, to hear why this is one of the groups that you're most focused on for 2023, where you think you could see continued outperformance. If you were to look at it from 30,000 feet, you would say, yeah, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, to some extent, JP Morgan, you throw in a US Bank Corp, they're all built the same way. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. They're in fact, look the same, but they all have different things that they're good at. And they all have different things that they're not so good at. And look at Citibank, for example, which has completely lagged its peers. And one of the reasons I believe it has done so Aside from the fact that city has been a bit of a disaster in and of itself, their European exposure does not help. Other banks far more reliant on the U.S. consumer. So you look at them and say they're all pretty much the same. In terms of valuations, the market rewards some of them and penalizes others. When you're talking about a city that trades at 65%-ish of tangible book, and then on the flip side, you see a J.P. Morgan, which is more than double that, you say clearly they're not built the same way. And I'll say this, I think the environment is okay for banks. I understand what Mike Mayo is saying, but in order for Bank of America to get to his price target, which is probably given the math, either side of $55 or so, Dan, you're talking about a stock that given the metrics out there and understanding that tangible book and book value would go up incrementally, would be trading at levels that effectively JP Morgan is trading at at its peak, which I just don't think is all that feasible or reasonable in this environment? I don't talk about individual names, but I'm going to do it for a second here. The the Bank of America thing, you have to look at what each company is most sensitive to. And just generally speaking, Bank of America is dependent on, let's call it consumer lending, consumer deposits, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more than some of the other companies, let's say Goldman, right? Goldman out today confirming they're cutting 3,200 jobs 
it used to be 4,000, so maybe 3,200 is better than 4,000, yeah. but the stress is bleeding into other sectors and financials is now feeling some of that pain. We haven't heard a ton from maybe the consumer-centric banks as much, but as time goes on, you, you might hear cost cutting coming from them too. What happened in the fourth quarter, if the 10 years coming down, the inversion got deeper, mm -hmm. right? And if you're a bank that's dependent on consumer lending, you're dependent on that piece of it in order to make money, a deeper inversion is not good for your business. It's just, it's pretty clear from that perspective. However, financials as a whole for the year, and, and it's so hard to make a call for an entire year. I mean, I want to change my mind, you know, in March, but for the whole year, first of all, I think 2023, if we had to really simplify it, is a valuation story above all else. And financials are the second cheapest sector in the index, trading at 12.5 times. And you've got an index at 17 times. And you still have growthy sectors that are much more expensive than that. So not just looking at valuations as the expectation for further returns in the future, but there's just less downside, right? They can't get hurt much more than they already did. Yeah. And you can protect yourself on that piece of it. I also think that banks are slightly overprepared for stress, or maybe they're prepared for stress like the global financial crisis, and that's just not what I would see this turning into. Yeah, so the banks bottomed in October when the 210 spread inversion was at its widest. Okay, so I think that's kind of interesting that, so it's kind of anticipating that, but when you talk about some of those that are dependent on consumer, I mean, the consumer is getting worse. The consumer is probably at its worst mm -hmm. spot since 2020 right now. And Guy, you made that point on many occasions here. When you just look at the data about consumer credit, where it's going, and, and again, on Friday, we're going to have University of Michigan consumer. Guy often says that the S&P is just an overlay of consumer confidence here. So we're going to start getting some better data on that. Um, I, I guess I'm most interested in what Jamie Dimon has to say. I think he's been unusually bearish for a year on, mm -hmm. on the kind of the health of the U.S. economy, mm -hmm. but also the global economy. He's been very careful. And I guess on the flip side of that, at some point, if we were to retest the October lows and let's say financial stocks in general were to participate to the downside, I guess I'd really want to get in there in Goldman and Morgan. When you think about some of the capital market activities that are away from sort of the consumer at some point, in 2023, the market or investors are going to start anticipating a much more active capital markets environment. And that's mm -hmm. where you get. Guy, uh, talk to me a little bit about Goldman right. and Morgan. No, for the first time in a while, the last couple quarters, Goldman Sachs specifically has been rewarded for their fixed income currency and commodities trading group. And you see it in the way the stock traded post earnings. And quite frankly, the environment hasn't changed all that much. If anything, it's gotten better for them. And I think they'll continue to do well. The question is, will the market continue to reward them? And I understand what Liz is saying. She's 100% right. I mean, these bank balance sheets have been fortified like they've never been in the history probably of US banks, which is a good thing. The problem is, I don't think like 0809, where banks were the epicenter, I think the epicenter will be somewhere else. And quickly, Dan, that 210 spread, which you talked about, which got out to 83 basis points, negative, troughed probably either side of 50 basis points recently. I happen to think it's probably headed down to minus 1% in the form of maybe 3.5% in the 10-year, 4.5% in the 2-year, and we'll see how banks react to it if, in fact, I'm right. I don't think personally that they're going to like it that much, but I also don't think they're going to crater necessarily on the back of that, Dan. All right, let's talk about oil really quickly here. Our friend Peter Bookbar over at Bleakly Advisors, he had a comment guy that speaks to a comment that you've made on many occasions of late. He's talking about in this morning book report, Biden Capital Management has a pretty good trade on. They started shorting oil at around 105, 110 right. in March of 2022, and even pressed it all the way down to current levels. They have now stopped on the short side. So what he's talking about is selling of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. At the time, you did not like the reasons for why they were doing that, but you've given them some kudos of late because, again, it ended up being a good trade. Yeah. Um, thoughts well, on, on what they do now? Oil doesn't act particularly well, despite the fact that China is supposedly reopening, right? And we're going to see all this demand. Again, you know, this is one of the major inflationary inputs that I think had a lot of investors worried in early 2022. It just hasn't really materialized. You've often said that some of these inputs from an 
inflationary standpoint, are going to be pesky and persistent. This is one mm. that hasn't really been that persistent. When the Biden administration released from the SPR, I criticized it, and I, I would still criticize it in terms of the reasons why. I don't think the SPR was put in place to be politically expedient and to show the populace that, hey, I understand your gas prices are a little bit higher. We're going to do what we can on our side. It was put in for much different reasons. Number one, with that said, uh, if they were just looking at this through the lens of a commodities trade, I mean, they crushed it. I mean, they shorted effectively at the top. Markets come in considerably. And if they can buy it back here, that's one of the great commodity trades of all time. I can speak to that because I did it for a very long time. The hard part in commodities trading is not putting on a position, Dan, as you know, it's taking it off. And as I sit here, you're right, the underlying commodity is clearly not performed. But I'm looking at the OIH, for example, trading with an earshot of effectively a 52-week high, which is pretty remarkable given the precipitous drop we've seen in the underlying commodity. OIH here at 315 or thereabouts. So there are a lot of strange things happening. I'm with Peter 100%. I hope the administration has been actively either buying back or attempting to buy back that SPR reserve. But if in fact they're waiting, I'm not quite sure what they're waiting for. I think there's a commitment to buy 3 million barrels in January. So they'll they'll either start or they've started buying already. And if you just look at the stock of crude oil that the U.S. has, so 275 million barrels still below the 10-year average, they have a lot to rebuild. And that keeps prices elevated in the underlying commodity. I think investors are learning a lesson here if they hadn't ever learned it before in their investing life that the underlying commodity and the stocks move in different directions sometimes. The thing about the stocks, about oil stocks, is that if 2022, the performance of dividend-paying stocks was so much better than anything else, for, rightfully so, right? In a rising rate environment and people wanted some cash, they had the bird in the hand argument. The dividend yield on, on energy in the S&P, 3.8% versus just under 2% for the overall index makes it more attractive. They've been decently shareholder friendly. There've been a lot of buybacks. I wouldn't expect them to stop that anytime soon. So I still think energy stocks can do okay in the beginning of this year. But we talked about this in 2022. The thing that almost always precedes a recession is a spike in oil prices. We already had the spike. I don't think we're going to have another spike. That's done. That's gone and behind us. Earnings are still strong for the energy sector, but at some point that peters out as well. And, you know, maybe the middle to second half of this year won't be quite as much of an energy in the spotlight situation. I love that saying, by the way, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. <laughs> I mean, that's so like 1875. People say that now they have no idea what they're talking about. Of course, I'm sure there was a point where people would quail hunt or those types of things. So if they, in fact, they were able to shoot a quail and have it effectively in his or her hand, that's better than two quails being out in the bush that they have yet to shoot, Dan, Nathan. That is the I think the genesis of that. All right, before we get out of here, we got to talk about Liz's Packers, but we also have to talk Oof. about somebody who's near and dear to your heart in your 59 years of life. This guy just turned 79 years old today, Jimmy Page, the guitarist of Led Zeppelin. And I got to tell you, this guy, you know, today. It, was a, wow. it, was a, it was a few years ago. I can't remember, maybe five or even 10 at this point. It was CNBC's. 25th anniversary remember they had some big gala event in lincoln center or somewhere and i remember leaving that event early because a friend of mine had this amazing invite to go meet jimmy page he was doing like a really small book signing at the old cbgb's which was now john barbados which is kind of embarrassing but they were doing it but i got like, <laughs> really kind of hauled, hauled ass out of there and i got to meet him and I, I shook his hand it was kind of like shaking the hand of god is that fair guy well, I don't want to go that far because, you know, John Lennon played that card many years ago. It didn't work out too well for the Beatles when he said that they had to walk back that whole we're more popular than Jesus thing. But I will say in terms of rock guitarists, Jimmy Page is clearly in the top five. And earlier today on Twitter, I sort of ranked the members of Led Zeppelin in terms of their musical ability. And I think, EY, you'd be interested in to my list. Um, I have John Bonham, the greatest rock drummer of all time, number one. But John Paul Jones, the underestimated, undervalued member of Led Zeppelin, number two. Jimmy Page, three, and Robert Plant, four. The genius of Led Zeppelin is, in fact, that their front person is last on that list. I had, As I said, Dan, earlier uh, on a recent show, I am in the top one half of 1% of Led Zeppelin fans, according to 
Spotify, they send you something at the end of the year, wrapped. like wrapped or something oh, like yeah. that. Yeah. Very proud of that, by the all way. All right. So really quickly. So we, we told you where you can find all of Liz's stuff, the SoFi blog, the, the, the podcast store, this and that, whatever. You know, little known fat guy. So she is at Liz Young Strat on the Twitter, but she used to be Liz Young 12. And I think that was like a oh, shout out not. to Aaron Rodgers, oh, who, who wouldn't give out. He, he wouldn't trade his jersey at the end of the last night's game no. with the Detroit Lions because was it the last time, Liz, that he walked out of the, the, I mean, the frozen? Yeah, we tundra. keep saying that. I yeah. just hope we don't go through the same thing that we did with Favre. Where it was the Jets Favre, and the uh, Vikings and the, all the, oh, my God, just, just hang it up, you know. Really but, yeah, you know, look, I didn't have high hopes. About halfway through the season, I thought, all right, that this is it. We're, like, we're done. We're not going to the playoffs. And then when we actually might have made it in as an 8-8 eight and eight team, and then up until the third quarter last night, I was like, oh, my God, we might pull this off. And then it all fell apart with an interception, as usual. <laughs> A terrible interception, a ball that he should not have thrown. He didn't see clearly that safety coming over. And I will tell you that peak Aaron Rodgers would not have thrown that ball. And when he walked off the field, I said to myself, this looks like a man who's played his last game in the green and yellow of the Green Bay Packers. And I am certain there are Jet fans out there that say, hey, <laughs> we tried this with Brett Favre back in the day and it didn't work out all that well, but maybe we'll take a spin with Aaron Rodgers and see, because a lot of Jet fans think that their team is ready to win now. The only thing, Dan, that held them back in this year was the play at the quarterback position, of which, by the way, they trotted out four different people varying degrees of success none all that good all right guys liz young thank you for being here with us on mondays yeah. we look forward to your contribution for 2023 so check us out i think next week is a holiday but we will do that the week after and stick around guys listen if you like what are we doing with danny Vinny, and porter tweet at them tell them we want to see this or hear this every week okay we just got to kind of force them to do it right now i think they're committed to doing it every other week they had a great conversation conversation so stick around for Danny Vinny welcome back to on the tape what are we doing first episode 2023 here with Vincent Daniel and Porter Collins my former Seawolf Capital partners who I've said many times just charged me and now have gone on to incredible returns read into that what you will but I read into it that they took their brains outside of just doing financials, applied all their knowledge to all other sectors, and are now uh, running free through the markets, doing as they please, not having to worry about outside investors, not have to worry about duration of capital, and sticking with themes and changing on a dime if they want. It makes life easier for sure. Guys, welcome back to What Are We Doing? and On The Tape. Good to be here. Thanks for having us, Danny. We turn the calendar here. What did you change in your positioning, if anything, as we ended 2022 and came into 2023? That's up for either of you. I think that we, we did a couple of things last year pretty well uh, in that in 2021, shipping was our big winner, right? We made tons of money in shipping and thankfully we successfully sold those in the first quarter of, of last year. So that, that was good. And you know we've been long energy for a long time and you know, to most people, energy, that that's just oil, right? Oil and gas. And we've rotated the energy book pretty well in that, you know, we first started off buying oil, then gas. And then, you know, for the most part, we're out of E&P stocks at this point. And, and we, we've, we've been out for better part of uh, three, four months now. And, you know, the majority of our performance last year was was coal stocks. And, and you know, no one cares about coal stocks. There's about seven of them. And I talk about every time I'm on the tape and no one cares still. And, you know, they, they were they were huge winners for us last year. We haven't really sold anything to this to date. So, you know, the only thing incrementally in energy we've been buying is we've been buying over the past three, four months, we've been buying some of the, the services names, which, you know, they they really lagged everything else. The CapEx has really been underinvested for a long time here. Almost every company in the services sector went, except for Schlumberger and the big guys, went into bankruptcy. And so, you know, we bought a lot of stocks out of bankruptcy and we're still in them. So Porter, I'll ask you this question. I want to hear from Vinny, but so one of the biggest things out there on energy in general is to your point, they watch the price of oil or maybe they watch gas and they make an assumption or I'm going to sell all the energy stocks or vice versa. I'm going to buy the energy stocks when these things are up. 
How do you guys play that? Because I think that's the one thing that's going to remain volatile throughout 2023. When you guys think about the names that you want to own in energy, how do you kind of take that out of the equation, so to speak? I don't think that we actually thought that energy prices would come down like this. Uh, you know, we, we've been nervous about natural gas, just given the fact that some of the LNG uptake is not until, the, you know, 24 and Europe had filled their storage. We still own Chesapeake, which has been a great winner for us out of bankruptcy. And for the most part, natural gas, that was one we were nervous about. And I don't know that oil goes a lot lower than here. I, I, I like a lot of the oil names, but yet we haven't yet bought back into them in a big way. We still own them a couple, but not in a big way. And I think that there there will be a chance to buy a lot of them. So that's where I'm kind of looking at. Vinny, you're the best modeler I've ever met, right? You get into the, whether it's on a bank or whatever it might be. So when you're modeling these energy companies and you have to put an input in, right? I mean, obviously their cost of capital and things like that. So when you're doing that on the bottom up work, what is it spitting out to you right now? Or how do you kind of gauge that? Well, that's one of the reasons why we have pretty much changed our tune a little bit within the energy space, right? Because if we rewind the clock for about two years ago, the EMP names were trading cheap and the inputs that you would put in, whether it was $60 oil, $70 oil, $80 oil, the stocks worked. They were just grotesquely cheap. And probably just as important as the price of oil was the management teams were handcuffed by the fact that no shareholder wanted them to invest any of their incremental cash flows in the form of new wells. So all the cash flows went to debt repayment and then eventually share repurchase and or dividends. So the return profile of these names were fantastic. Now let's bring up to date, current to date. They haven't invested in any new wells, yet the price of oil is down. And just as important, the prices they have to pay for the wells or for the rigs that they're using have gone up considerably. That's where their inflation lies. So we actually started to take a look and say, well, wait a second. If the inflation that they're experiencing is coming from the underlying things that dig this stuff out of the ground, which are the rigs, let's take a look at the oil field services names, because they're the ones that are actually experiencing the positive side of inflation. Not only that, we also have to keep in mind that in general, demand for all things energy, just consumption, goes up roughly around nominal GDP or a little bit less than nominal GDP, yet the depletion factor of the supply of oil is probably minus seven, eight percent. Simple math. Demand staying steady. Depletion is declining. They need more rigs to drill more oil by the oil field services. That was our call, and that's why we shifted the portfolio. You bring up a great point because nine times out of 10, if you go into either an economic downturn or stagnation of some kind. Historically, the energy companies had bad balance sheets or they were levered to the hilt. So it's very different this time. And to me, that's the main difference in this. People expect energy to act a certain way if the economy is acting a certain way. But to your point, Vin, they haven't been spending the money on CapEx. Therefore, their balance sheets are in the best shape. I'm going to say this without knowing it, the best shape they've ever been on a relative basis, right, to an economic downturn. So is that accurate? Uh, yes, but I would also keep in mind, let's think about Q4 earnings in that I don't think the earnings trajectory for the EMP companies are going to be that favorable, right? Simply because oil is down and I think people are going to be lowering their numbers. So as a result, for me, I'd rather avoid them at least initially. But I think at some point this year, as Porter suggested, we're probably going to come back to these names in size, particularly as the slowdown in the economy hits if these stocks continue to go down, which they might, we'll be stand ready there, ready to buy them. One of the things we've actually been adding to is a couple of the South American names like Petrobras and uh, Ecopatrol. Those names have been killed because of political uncertainty. Look at margin of safety. The price you're paying is just a lot cheaper, right? You're paying under two times EV to EBITDA. Yes, there's some political risk, but there's also a lot of political risk in the United States at this point. So I just think that if you're patient and you, you, you see how things move, you're able to you know change pretty quickly and, and, and buy opportunities as they, as, they, as they come to you. So the way it works out there, obviously, is if you're a portfolio manager at Wellington or Fidelity and you have to beat a benchmark, that's how you get compensated. You have to make a decision. If the S&P weighting and energy is five or six, I'm going to go eight or nine. I'm going to go out on a limb and do that. Do you think the people, given what we're going to get into and talk about the rest of the sectors that are out there, is it strong enough to validate an overweight over the course of the year in general in energy? Or do you think it'll work its way back to kind of a neutral number? And to be frank, I don't even know where we are right now 
on a weighted basis on the S&P because I think it's a big factor in terms of money flows for energy. I think Vin and I are both on the same page in this one. Nobody owns these stocks. I mean, they might own Exxon and Chevron and a couple others, but in general, there's there's no one looking at these things. There's about seven people looking at the coal stocks. There's no one looking at the services names that we're in. If you're the portfolio manager and you need energy exposure, they're just going to Exxon and Chevron and calling that their energy exposure and overweighting it that way, just given that they're the most liquid and big ones. Vinny, there's about seven that? other yeah. names, but you know, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Seven, they're just going oh, yeah. to the top. So. There's still a lot of, there's, there's not a lot of eyes on some of the names that you're kind of talking about and referring to where there's potentially a lot of alpha. If you have 50% free cash flow yields, by definition, people aren't looking at them. <laughs> and, Something and must that, be wrong. Yeah. And, and not only that, take a step back, at least the way we're thinking about this. I actually do think there's going to be an opportunity to buy these things potentially cheaper, particularly the names that people know and the EMP names and the like. Let's take a step back and think about the next five, 10 years. We have just woefully underinvested in the energy space, partially because of QE, partially because of the shale revolution, partially because of ESG, all of the above. And we need a major CapEx cycle in all things energy. And so we remain wildly bullish on the entire vertical. Now it's just a function of can we invest correctly and time some of these things so we could avoid, which is the obvious 20, 30, 40% drawdowns that you typically get in these names because of their, people are quite skittish when they're investing in a cyclical. We're about to put out our annual letter. And, and in, uh, we, I think Vinny pointed out in the letter that we're in very early innings of this of this energy cycle. And so- uh, Vinny, is there a Rocky Four reference in your letter? Because you, we did that a couple of times at Seawolf, back in our Seawolf days. Yeah. It starts off at Rocky Four. Exactly. So, so you got a picture of Balboa, and then we go into a long-winded discussion about, we could talk about it later on if you want, about our fiscal woes right now, the U.S. fiscal woes. Oh, we're going to talk about that. So let's- Let's there move other on. other Italian American movies in there, of course. Yes, of course. I, 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 He's a great writer. Guy Adami would love reading this thing. That's yeah. all. Cas the casino, Goodfellas, you know, it has it all. All right, just for people that are dropping in for the first time listening to this, so just as way of background, I mean, I worked with Steve Eisman, Vincent Daniel, and Meredith Whitney at Oppenheimer in the mid 90s. Got to meet Porter in the early 2000s when he was working with Steve Eisman at Chilton. And then when they went to Front Point, uh, I joined them in early 2006 in time to short all the mortgage companies and buy credit default swaps and all that stuff that went on. So the reason I say this as a background is we have seen a lot, three of us, we've seen many, many cycles. And the one thing that messed with us the most, I think, was really adjusting to kind of the free money QE period. You know, we, we saw the end of the world happen, the three of us, among other people with, with Steve and others. And when you see something like that, it's hard to ever get it out of your mind, right? And so then we fought the QE tape, so to speak, I think in you know, 2010, 11, 12, 13, and here we are. We're on the other side of it. So we know what it's like to be on the other side. And I don't believe that the majority of investors out there remember or want to remember or realize what can happen or what will happen when one money is not free. They only know QE for the most part, and you always get bailed out, this kind of moral hazard thing. So with that in mind, guys, and Vinny, I'm going to start with you on this. How do we readjust to this new, new? And what inning are we in of this kind of readjustment period? Because we are just at the beginning of the liquidity pull, in my opinion, for, for the most part. It'll be interesting to see where we are in the liquidity pull, because I actually think the next phase of this for me is the <laughs> earnings pull, right? Meaning we're probably at the beginning or in the middle of a, a decent economic slowdown. I don't know how long it lasts, but and I actually think you're going to start to see this manifests itself over the next two quarters in the form of earnings. I've always felt that it is really difficult to go out and buy stocks when the trajectory of the E, trajectory of the earnings are going down. And so to me, as we start walking into the slowdown in the recession, the biggest question we have for ourselves, and we sort of attack it two different ways, is what is the Fed going to do if and when that happens? So far, they've been able to just stand pat, mainly because employment is great. And, and quite frankly, they, are, they seem to be scared to death of financial conditions loosening. I think they know what they're up against in terms of making sure the inflation beast doesn't come back. So, but as, so long as they stand pat, this is going to be a very difficult market to just go out and quote unquote, buy the dip like, they, like people did over the past 14 years. You just said something that, you know, the Fed minutes came out this week, right? And you read into them, whatever, they're backwards looking to a degree, but they specifically pointed out basically 
market conditions, right? Whether it be credit or stock market, everyone wanted to read into that, that they're using that as, as a barometer. And they don't want to see the market rally. And they don't want to see credit spreads uh, loosen, right? They, they want to see things continue to tighten to, quote, send the message. And it helps explain why Powell is vehemently, you know, I'm hawkish, I'm hawkish, I'm hawkish. When in the background, you go back to Jackson Hole 2021, inflation was still transitory. I mean, that was August 2021. So we know they're probably over tightening here. But you're right. You bring up a great point. Every time we get one of these rallies like we have today, obviously in the markets, because you had a job number that, by the way, was fine, but wage pressures dropped a little bit. So, you know, you can get a sense for how boiled up the, what a coiled you, you spring this might did. be. Yeah, I think they did. But my but my point is that, and Porter, I'm going to get your thoughts here, is that I feel like we go through this exercise over and over again. And to Vinny's point, we just had Mike Wilson on the tape on our last episode, and he made the same point that Vinny just made. The E, we're going to transition the handoff from the Fed being just kind of noise and background to what earnings look like. So Porter, with that, you know, and, and you having looked at many sectors over the years, follow up on Vinny's thoughts and give me your thoughts on that. I actually just want to zoom out here a little bit. You know, my, my brother Dwight had, had us on a conference call uh, three months ago with, with some of his uh, employees and investors. The context of the conversation was the anatomy of a bear market. Because we've lived through it together, how do we think about trading a bear market? How do we think about investing in a cycle? And I think people have to realize that this is a cycle. And, you know, I, I was going through some of, you know, Bob Farrell's top 10 quotes recently. And number two there is excess in one direction will lead to an opposite excess in the other direction. Number four is exponentially rising or falling markets usually go further than you think, but do not correct by going sideways. And so if you think about that and you think about how we think about markets, the easy the easy part for us last year was shorting stocks. And you know we we did did very, very well shorting stocks because you know we knew that the Fed was out of its league and they woefully missed inflation, right? You know, missing inflation to where it would go nine percent, eight percent, I think it went to. You know, they got it woefully wrong, and they're still cleaning up this mess. And so I think that all the excesses, whether it was Tesla, whether it's snowflake, whether it's apple, all all, all this stuff went, way further than we ever thought it would. And now it's just correcting back the other way. You know, I think, you know, I'm proud of uh, the last podcast we did. We went full Monty crazy bearish on Tesla. And I, I listened to it a couple of days later. I was like, wow, we're, we're pretty aggressive there. But everything that worked for Elon on the way up, it was beautiful, is working equally on the way down, right? He's selling stock. Investors are dumping margin calls. It's 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 cascading. You know, prices are are falling in China. You know, demands weakening. Everything it's happening in the exact way that it worked on the way up. You look at this now, and people are saying, "Well, maybe it is a car company. Maybe it is a cyclical." And what do we pay for this thing? And and so I think things are just coming back to reality. And this is the the reality of an economic cycle. And people just got way too carried away with the bullishness on one side. And again, I think it's just going to go further than you think. One of the reasons Danny was so good in a bear market is he just, he kept pressing. You know, I remember in, you know, 06, 07, 08, you just, you were very good at just pressing every rally and expecting it to go further than you think. And so I think this year will be a, another tough one for the Bulls. Took 17 minutes to mention Tesla. You just want to throw that in there in the middle of like, you know, things. Let's pull back for a second. I, I want to talk that. about it. I don't, I, no, I don't no, want to. I, you know, I know, but you can't myself, just go but, down you know, that okay. road, right? You can't just go down. The, no, no pun intended on that without digging in further. So That'd be you kind of alluded road, to this. Yeah. I've, been, I've been saying it's turning from a you know, secular story to a cyclical story. You can ignore the corporate governance. You can ignore all the other stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a cyclical company. And then people realize it's not this robo taxi tech thing and whatever. It's an industrial company, auto company. And so to me, that's what's happening on that. And by the way, many other names. And the other thing I want to say in general, and I said this on the podcast yesterday, I don't care how much a stock is down from its highs because it never should have been at that spot. I'm not even talking about Tesla specifically, but that's the perfect example is why people use, oh, it's down 70%. I'm going to buy it. Really? Because that was my thought on Carvana. Was shorting it at 300, it went to 80. It was a better short at 80 when the story became they have the greatest, you know, mousetrap and used car history. This is the coolest model. You know what? Cards speak at the end of the day, balance sheets speak. And so we're still a ways away on Tesla from that full unwind, but it may be coming. But in general, I think, Vinny, that theme and looking at companies from the bottom up, not from where they came, but where they may be going. And I want to focus on the consumer. 
because this economy has been, will, is, and will always be driven by the U.S. consumer. Debt's never been higher. Savings have never been lower. How are we going to get through this? We look at auto finance. We look at mortgage finance. Look at all this stuff. How do you jive on this, Vinny? It's hard to be bullish. Is that as a backdrop? Yes, it is. It's funny. I was going to do an old Seawolf thing. I felt like getting yelled at for about a good five minutes, but maybe, maybe, maybe I'll save it for a later time. Let's talk about the consumer. That's one of the reasons why I think the E is going to be a challenge for the entire year. So one of the things we always used to look at, we, I mentioned it before on the prior podcast, was nominal credit card growth. I think it's a big indicator of, of two things. One, future growth in the US economy, because if car growth is well below nominal GDP, that's a very bullish indicator to me. It's a bullish indicator from a credit perspective. It's a bullish indicator from a growth perspective. Unfortunately, we're on the opposite side of that, where credit card growth is growing way, way faster than nominal GDP. So what does that mean to me? It means to me that we're going to have probably a slower economy because I don't know where people are going to see the economic growth if the consumer is quote unquote, or at least a portion of the consumer, a good portion of the consumer is tapped out. So that combined with higher rates, particularly at the, at the short end of the stick, which is the two year treasury and its impact on auto, and as well as the impact on housing, you're kind of wiping out some of the bigger leading indicators of economic growth. And so as a result of that, I. I think you're going to have a tough challenge with the, with the earnings side of the equation just going forward. Let me guess. You were going to talk about seasonally, this is a great time for credit. You don't want to be shorting credit company. What, what, what were you going to pull from the Seawolf? No, archive? I was going to piss you off even more. Give it to <laughs> me. Um, over the last, say, two, three weeks, we've actually covered some Tesla. Well, I, that's smart. I, I mean, you know. Well, you know, but. You so know, have you know, I. For full disclosure, it, I mean, it makes, so, it, we, it, it makes it weird because we do own Tesla Q. So it was actually getting bigger as. The stock yeah. went down. So it, it, there was anyway. one day we covered a chunk and the size of our position was bigger. Right. You know, and that was very weird. And um, by, the, by, by the way, Tesla was, we ignored all risk limits on Tesla. It was like, a, <laughs> well, it's yeah. good. You don't have anyone to report to but yourselves. <laughs> by the way, you know, when I watch behavioral finance and I, you know, I, I remember back in the fall when S&P, I think, upgraded Tesla's debt, meaningless, but they did it. There was two other pieces of good news. I think I either tweeted it out that day or mentioned it on the podcast. That to me was when I really got really bearish, when stocks like Tesla and other things stopped going up on what used to make a stock move, 5, 10, 15%. You know that it's saturated. You know that the last buyer is in. So to me, the question is, when is the last seller you know, kind of out? And guys, I can't get past kind of where the thing is still, you know, 16, 1700 on a split adjusted basis, right? So just yes. multiply wherever it is times 15. And then in my mind, just go back to four years ago on the funding secured bullshit and all this stuff that's gone on. Yeah, sure. They've made more cars since then, but you know what? They're going to be less profitable going forward because inflation's getting them. The cycle's going to get them. I just can't their count, see- Their counting is actually going to catch up to them too. So the, I will cover the stock when I think there's a fundamental reason. Of course, you have to cover when stock goes from 200 to 110 you know, you have to, you, you have to cover your stock. Granted, your position got smaller as the stock went down for the most part, unless you're using TSLQ, but that's the right risk management tool, right? But, but, the, but the funny thing is, is Danny, you yeah. can see it in the, in the action. Nobody is short this stock. I mean, absolutely nobody is short this stock. Yeah. I actually think I take it the other way, Porter. No one seems to want to own this stock, right? Yeah. So, so even on days like today, and it's Friday right now, and the markets are ripping, right? Uh, Tesla's Rip. up. For, I was going to mention that too. Tesla yeah. was Tesla is up from its lows, but it's not really it's significantly outperforming. And Danny, as you mentioned, you're looking at the price on the police pre-split adjusted basis where it's been. I'm really looking at it right now on a market cap basis. So, so I'm sort of defining in my head. Yeah, 350 where, billion where, makes no sense, right? Where what market cap makes sense for a company like this, giving some credit for maybe their technological prowess, don't yell at me, but we're not there yet, right? So we're, we're not low enough yet where I could say, all right, at these levels, I could see why someone would wanna own it if FSD, if battery pack, if all these things that I hear about come to fruition. The problem was at the levels where the stock was and really where it is right now, you're still sort of taking into account a high degree of probability that all of those you know things in 2040 are going to work just so everyone out there so vinnie used to do this thing and he knew it would bother me but 
he couldn't help himself. So we'd be in the office. It'd be like, I don't know, 8.30 in the morning, 8.45. I was obviously most of the time bearish on everything. And there'd be some data point or maybe even an, an earnings that came out, whatever. And the market was going to rally or a particular stock was going to rally big. And I'd hear Vinny because he sat four feet from me go. And I look up, I'm like, mother F. I'm like, well, this guy, he's going to. And he go, rip. <laughs> and it used to drive me. I had to leave the office when he would do the rips. It used to drive me insane. So we're like, if this print on the economic numbers bad, the market's going to get killed. Because this is back when bad was bad and good was good. Not all this you know, stuff that goes on with the Fed anyway. So that's a kind of an inside uh, By the way, joke. Danny, what you yeah. might not know about that is inside our office, the other guys who work with us used to, used to email me, text me, please do it. Please do it. Oh, you're such a serious. And, 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 yeah. and, and then after I did it, what really got, I knew I would get you. You were, you, you were, and then. Easy, the, easy mark. Yeah. Porter would eventually say, just, Vinny, shut the fuck up. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> we need him. We need him focused uh, on the trades. All right. So enough on Tesla. Enough on that. Let's, let's focus but, on what wait, I think. Yeah, go ahead, one, Porter. One thing we, we were talking about with some yeah. of the guys this week is, you know, house prices. And it's a little bit different than the subprime days of, of 2008, but you know, coastal U.S. And, and certainly Mountain West U.S. house high-end house prices, I think, are going to fall 20 to 30 percent. It's hard to be bullish. When you have that view, it's hard to be bullish on the consumer. You know, I think a lot of these houses were, were bought on margin uh, on stocks. They took out margin loans on, on their stocks. Or crypto. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I, but like all, all the houses in the Mountain West, all these, you know, everyone bought a house in, in uh, Utah, and I think a lot of these houses were bought on on margin loans, you know, of guys in the West Coast and huge stock gains. And so, go back to Bob Farrell's rules, you know, excess in, in one direction leads to a you know a corresponding pullback in the other. I just think that the that you you see a big deflation in a lot of these assets. It's still to come, and so it just it takes time. And and the same thing about a credit cycle. Like a credit cycle here is 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 natural. It's going to come. And, you know, as Vinny and I were looking at the other day, one of the questions from um, from Twitter was, you know, what do you guys think of the, of the you know, the corporate debt market? And the, the, the debt market is so much larger than it was in, in 2008. And, you know, I don't have to you know, talk to you about the, how big the fixed income ETFs are and how, yeah, they don't make any sense whatsoever. And so I think that you'll, you're going to see a lot of fallout from fixed income ETFs, from downgrading of securities from, from to fallen angels and stuff like that. So I, I think this just the cycle is going to take a lot longer than people think, and, a, 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 and it's going to, be, going to be nastier than people think. Yeah, so you bring up a couple of points. One is we went this whole time, and we don't have to spend time crypto. It's in such the background now. Everything's kind of blown up. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not going to try to predict the price of... Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm surprised they've held in like they have, but we'll just leave that kind of aside for a second. But I just mentioned crypto and kind of passing, and we're not going to spend much time on it because it kind of feels like that, that fad has kind of come and go. It'll be around. I'm surprised these things have held up. But crypto did steal gold's thunder, I believe, over the last several years. And I think gold is finally in a position that it should benefit almost under any any scenario that you can really paint here going forward, whether it's geopolitical or the Fed pivot or you know, shortage of the physical, whatever. Give me your guys' thoughts on that because if I were to pick one thing right now that I'm the most bullish on, um, other than Tesla puts, of course, it would be gold. And so I want to get your guys' thoughts on gold because we didn't talk about this prior to getting on today. Give me your updated thoughts here. Let's just do a quick aside in, in crypto. You know, I we, I got a lot of pushback on the uh, Silvergate short that we were, we, we were pushing for a while. You know, it was just so obvious to, to us that the whole ecosystem was going to get killed. And I think Vinny talked about it previously, the, the perfect Ponzi, he, he called it. Um, you know, and he said, the, you know, I think he also said the only thing it was good for was laundering money and speculation. And so, and you think about it in that context, and you think That's about- That's a pretty good call, Vin. Yeah, go ahead, Porter. <laughs> and, you, and you think about it in the context of, you know, it looks a lot like Wirecard, right? In, in terms of processing illegal transactions, which- which happened to be the case, and and so I I think it ends and uh, eventually ends in zero for us. It wasn't that hard of a call. Yeah. Thoughts on gold? We've always viewed it as sort of the report card of central banks, and we were joking around where guy was giving them uh, high marks, but Porter, in in typical Danny Moses fashion, couldn't possibly give them a high mark because he hated them so much. So he F. gave them an F. And I'll also say that during your guys' review of on the tape review, you guys were sort of talking defensive and apologetic that gold didn't work last year. 
and you know, I wanted to pull a Reale like he would on the sports reporters whenever there were errors. That was an error. Like Gold actually did really well last year relative to almost oh, yeah. every other asset class. And now I actually think it's it's time to shine simply because I can't see the Fed continuing its tightening policies over the course of 2023. I, I can't tell you when. I don't know when the Fed's going to pivot or, or how much they're going to cut, if they're going to cut. But the days of them tightening 75 basis points, even 50 basis points, were probably in the latter innings. I mean, and as a result, I think you're seeing it already that gold is sniffing it out. Not only that, if you believe like I do, that our country, as well as other countries, are going to run chronic fiscal deficits as far as the eye can see, and they're going to need to debase you to basically make that happen. Gold is the best asset you want to own if, if that's your belief system. Porter, correct me if I'm wrong. I know you've done work on this. You know, There's the paper gold market and the physical gold market. People believe they're exposed to gold in the GLD. Sure, to a degree, you do get some exposure there directionally. But at the end of the day, like I think we're moving towards a physical, 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 what do I own? What is this? And I feel to me like it's going to be some type of mania. Porter, give me your thoughts on that because I know you've done work on kind of physical market versus paper. As you know, we've, we've been sort of bullish on uh, and owned gold in some form or fashion since 2016-ish. And so I don't know if that makes me a gold bug or not, but you know, we, we believe in tangible backing of, of gold. And so you know, over the past, I would say, four to five months, we've really been buying a lot of gold. And now it's probably the biggest sector in our portfolio. As you know, I, the top positions I know it's you know one, two, and three. You know, we own gold, physical gold, physical silver, and and some miners. Do you and still have the A mark, by the way? Because I'm still in that AMRK. Anyway. Never sold a share. You know, we 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 sort of have been, have been tracking this thing for a long time and figuring out when it's going to work, how it's going to work. But you know, we we just much rather be in gold than than treasuries and Vinny, or Danny's laughing at me. Rather like, tomato, rather, you yeah. prep school, whatever, <laughs> rower, go ahead, keep going. Rather but, tomato. But you know, everyone wants to own treasuries, right? Okay, great. But if I, if I look at the US treasury, it's disgusting. The budget deficit is out of control. You know, the, the biggest buyers of treasuries are gone. You know, China, India, Russia, they're sellers of treasuries, not buyers, and they're buyers of gold. And so, you know, I want to buy the asset that looks the best and fundamentally looks the best, not not the asset that fundamentally looks the worst, which is treasuries. And so it, it may work, but I, I've sort of left it alone. I'd rather stay in T-bills in the front end of the curve and earn my four and change percent. I think that gold has a lot of upside here. And especially as, you know, the, the Fed's going to pivot, they're going to pause or call what you will. And, and the stock market's going to rally, but we think the gold market's going to rally a lot. And we think the energy stocks are going to rally a lot when that happens too. So that that's how we're playing it. We'd, we'd rather not, you know, dive deep in beaten down tech. It's just not what we're going to do when, I don't know, we'll see what we do with our shorts in tech. But Well, the nice thing about this AMARC is it has a 2.3% dividend yield because they lend out, right, against their holdings, right? They lend out to consumers, if I'm not mistaken, on the gold. I mean, there's pretty good collateral. And so as rates move higher, they can, you know, obviously move their rates higher as well. Am I wrong on that? Because it's a really interesting company. The way I look at AMRK is that it's one of the few places where you could play precious metals. That's not a depleting asset. It's actually a broker and people are going there trading gold and, and it's, it's a semi capital light business. They do vertically own their own mints. And so they have very high returns on invested capital. They are judicious with their capital. And usually at the end of the year, we get some form of a special dividend. And if the stock goes too low, we get some form of share repurchase. And I believe the company, I forget the exact number, Porter, maybe you could help me out, is 30 to 40% owned by the insiders, which, yes. which, is, which is usually a check that we love to see boxed off, that they're in there with you. But Danny, you go back to the question about the, the paper gold market versus the physical gold market. I think it's like 125% in gold, I think it's like 400, 400 to one in terms of silver. So, you know, the, there's just not that much physical bullion and physical silver backing a lot of these paper assets. And so as the price climbs, you're going to see people chase and chase the hard, the hard metal. Well, that's my point. We can close the book on this one. But, you know, people used to buy crypto or thought that you could buy crypto kind of as a hedge for central bank you know, in inferiority. And now I feel like that trade, first of all, people don't even have a way to pretty much buy crypto anymore, right? Maybe Coinbase still exists, but but I think you get my point. I think gold may be the solve for whatever's left of people that want to express that never had in the past 
had a reason to question the global central banks, right, or fiat money in general. It feels like gold finally has its day in the sun. So, guys, you know, one of the, Danny, one of the interesting things about crypto, and and it, I'll tie it to one of your passions, cannabis, is that is the on and off ramp to the the banking markets. And so, as the crypto market exploded, they had this huge on ramp from the banking markets, and so you were able to take your fiat dollars and place them into, into crypto really easily and, and it allowed many other criminal activities to happen as well. But you know, as that money is sucked out back into the banking system and those on and off ramps are closed down, which they should be, to crypto, you know, that 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 crushes that asset. And so just like, you know, when eventually they, they open up the banking system to the cannabis industry. And that's going to be a huge boon for them too. And so, you know, we, we always look at these links to in and out of the banking system. And, you know, you think back to oil and gas, you know, they haven't had ac- any access to, not any access, very little access to the funding markets. And so they've had to totally transform their balance sheets into very low levels of debt, high levels of cash and, and self-fund a lot of these the things they're doing. And so, you know, that's the whole context of how we think about the banking system and interplay with with a lot of these different assets. All right. Last thing before we get out of here, we got to talk about the banks in general, you know, the Wall Street banks versus the consumer banks. We're going to hit earnings. It's always the first one that comes around, right? We're going to get a pretty good read. It's not going to be pretty, obviously. Q4, what are your guys' thoughts on the banks as we enter 2023? First of all, I, I want a public service message. People that have historically have had a large percent of their money in the checking account should not have that in their checking account. So, you know, the, the money market funds, you can get four and change percent, whereas in the, your checking account, you're still getting one basis point at, at Bank America, right? So people should be pulling their funds from checking accounts and, and parking all excess cash and other money funds or high yield or sort of, uh, you know, high savings account funds. And so that, that's what I would do. And, and that leads to what we think about the banking system right exactly. now, right? Which is, if you think about a bank, what, what its moat is more than anything else is the fact that they have the lowest and cheapest cost of debt capital that tends to be very sticky, right? In the form of deposits. However, this cycle, there's actually competition for that and very stiff competition in the form of, as Porter just said, two-year treasury T-bills, where you're actually getting a higher rate of return than you are on your deposits in your checking account, or even a CD for that matter. In addition, for corporations, there's this new little tool that the Fed came out called the reverse repo facility, where you have the ability to park your money there, get daily liquidity, you have as much safety in the reverse repo facility as you do as a bank, and you're getting about 200 bips extra there. So This is a long-winded way of saying we expect a tremendous amount of deposit outflows from the banking system. And you actually saw that while it was different at Silvergate. But if that continues to happen, that is a lot of stress on the balance sheets of financial services. And we're not talking about them going under. What we're really talking about is that you probably have seen peak NIM and then probably two to three quarters afterwards, you start to have a credit issue. So this is, again, another long window of saying it's we've been negative on regulated financial services. Yeah, because I talked about on the podcast with Mike Wilson about the SLR, which is the banks are forced to carry X amount of capital against treasuries. I actually believe that will be one of the things that the Federal Reserve comes in and 100%. eases for the 100%. bank. So I think we'll see that happen. But it's a lot of pain between here and there of any of your point of pain. But and, and just, by the way, if they do that, Danny, they better be right. Because if they're wrong, we're having a massive banking crisis. Right. That's a, exactly. So I and believe it, we're going to take that. it a step further, Danny. If they do that, then our banks are going to migrate towards the way of Japanese banks and European banks. And those generally trade at a permanent discount to tangible book value. So there's going to be a long way down. But I still think it's a high probability that they relax the SLR. And if they do that, the banks will probably initially rally on that. And, you know, we'll be shorting the crap out of them at that point. So will treasuries, I would think, would rally at that point. So let's close out. So is there any banks you guys actually like? Is it JP Morgan that you want to buy if it gets weak? What's the kind of the top one or two banks that you want to own in the midst of this cycle we're going to? I'd rather see the teeth, the eyes and teeth of a recession and and an acknowledgement of credit defaults. JP Morgan's an obvious one. I mean, we I think we all sit here card carrying lovers of Jamie Dimon, whatever he does. Uh, I always go back towards the consumer finance names. Capital One, not right now, but maybe in American Express, I would like to see it go lower, mainly because I love the credit card business within the banking system. 
And in generally, they tend to be the most cyclical. So they get hit the hardest. So the stocks go down the most, but it's arguably one of the more resilient and highest ROA businesses the banks have. So those are the things that I'll be looking at, assuming they get hit. And they don't have this sort of same acute uh, funding shift that the, the big banks do. All right, guys, well, listen, I know we're going to try to do this more often. I think we've done this, I don't know, five, six, seven times. I'd like to do it twice a month if we can. And I think the timing is good to come back in a couple of weeks. And when the banks do report, we should have a lot of insight, I think, into how they're starting to position themselves. Because I do think, and I think you guys agree, that the whole financialization of the entire market, right, is really based upon the amount of leverage, the amount of debt in the system and how you're structured. And a lot of clues are going to come, I think, from the bank on what they're seeing happen in real time in their corporate and consumer credit portfolios. So thank you guys for coming on this again and uh, look forward to having you and hopefully seeing you in person in a couple of weeks, boys. And Vinny, happy early birthday, buddy. Thank you, sir. Do we get Guy and Dan back? Uh, I'm sure they, you know, Dan wants to yell at us about. Yeah, know, no, hold, definitely, too definitely. We, yeah, exactly. But we will get him on, and you're going to get another bottle of Comos on this. I'm, I'll make sure that what are we doing will, qualifies. Yeah. Although I will say, if the Giants make a long run, and I think they might in the oh, playoffs, yeah. I, he he might be unbearable, guy. Guy, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. All right, so, boys. Congratulations on been on another great Jet season too. <laughs> God, Jesus. On that note, <laughs> they suck. 